We're very happy today to have Professor Peter Nash, formerly Dean of the School of Environmental Studies at the University of Waterloo, uh, a geographer with a very varied career. Today I'm going to ask him about his background and the influences on his own career experience. Uh, Peter, begin, I was born. <laughs> that I was, actually not too far from here where we are sitting, uh, not in Switzerland, but in Germany, in the city of Frankfurt, where I spent the early years of my life, uh, ele where I had my elementary education. Mm -hmm. And then my parents moved to France, where I spent a couple of years. Then I was shipped off to England to a public school. And from there, my parents moved to the United States. I spent high school in England. Uh, in in uh, California, California, in Los Angeles. Junior high was in England, high school in California. I went to the university in California, wow. then the army, then back to California, Wisconsin. But I think you want probably a few more details. Oh, uh, each of those uh, places must uh, have left an impression. It was not something that I decided on very early in my life being a geographer, yes. but it's something that developed rather gradually. Mm -hmm. I must say that revisiting the place of one's birth, which I did just a few days ago before coming to Geneva, the city of Frankfurt, uh, gives you somewhat of a clue as to what really went on in my own mind and what might have planted the seed and developed some of this geographic thirst yes. that uh, we are interested in. Yes. And I know this is one of the things you, you are particularly yes. concerned with. I was walking along the river mine with my wife and showed her the house where I was born on the Untermeinkai where I lived the first four years of my life, the house in which I was born. And I remember sitting on the balcony of that house, overlooking the Mine River, and seeing the boats coming down the mine, and also going up the mine, of course, mm -hmm. and thinking to myself, where are these boats going? And uh, people were rather imp imprecise about mm -hmm. their answers. Oh, they're going to the ocean, they said. But I said, I, I answered, well, how far away is the ocean? Can we go there? And they said, oh, no, the ocean is very far away. So I think even at that age, I was probably about four years old, I asked my father to show me a map. And I remember he had a huge globe in his study, too. And he showed me that not far down the river, the mine flows into the Rhine at Mainz. And then later on, on some of our bicycle tours, we went down the Rhine uh, Graben, so to speak. And then I found out it still had to go through Holland. Mm -hmm. And uh, then as my... Heimat, as we used to call it, and some people still call it that, uh, expanded, and I was able to walk around more by myself before the area turned, uh -huh. and it was no longer so safe to walk around in. I used to walk t to the Hauptbahnhof, the uh, main station of Frankfurt. Uh, I wasn't supposed to go there, but I did. Uh -huh. And there were these 24 platforms, and there were big signs where all these trains were going. And um, so this sparkled my imagination, and, and I made mental travels as to, I said to myself, what train will I take today? Mm -hmm. And I'd go to platform eight to take a train to Zurich, or to Paris, or to Milan, or mm -hmm. wherever. And I think, and I walked to the, Hauptbahnhof this time mm -hmm. um, with my wife. And um, 
and all these thoughts came back to me. What uh, years are we talking about now? We are talking now <coughs> about 1925, 1926. Okay. And then another thought occurred to me. We were staying at the Frankfurt Canadian Pacific Plaza Hotel, which is a, a very high hotel, high-rise hotel, near the Festhalle. Looking down on the neighborhood uh, where to my parents moved after we moved away from the Mainkai, Unter Mainkai address to the West End, which really was my home for three or four more years. And there I recognized all kinds of important foci in the city. And I realized that in that period, my interest in cities beca began. Mm -hmm. And I identified uh, these f focal points, whether it was the Festhalle, or the Hauptwache, mm -hmm. or the Bockenheimer Landstrasse, mm -hmm. or the Zeil, a, ma mm -hmm. a major shopping street. And I could go on naming these. Mm -hmm. But what intrigued me is that even though the city has changed enormously, Mm -hmm. These important foci are still there, mm -hmm. all the important points, the reference points, and they're still very much important to the, to the citizens who live there. That's they're still important reference points. And all, and to some extent, the Hauptwache, which is the, the, uh, perhaps the major focus of the city, mm -hmm. is still the major focus now uh, because all the... Um, tramway lines, all the streetcar lines, all the subway lines sort of focus on that. Just like Paris is a focus for France, yeah. Yeah. the Hauptwache is the focus for Frankfurt. But all the streetcar lines are still there and still have the same numbers. And, and all the numbers came back to me because I used to sit <coughs> in the streetcar lines and just travel from one end of the city to the other I see. and investigate all the suburbs, whether it was Schwanheim or Offenbach or Oberursel and so yeah. on. And so I think from a very early age, I was, became interested in the city, uh, the site of Frankfurt, mm -hmm. as well as the situation because of the river, yes. And the railroad. And, and, and the railroad, yeah. not because I traveled anywhere, mm. but because I saw all these choo-choo trains coming, coming and going. And uh, so all these thoughts came back to me just a few days ago when I visited Frankfurt again and showed the city of my birth to my That's wife. That's marvelous. It could not have that been I thought about geography at that time. No. Uh, in fact, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, I only had about two years of Erdkunde in the, in the gymnasium. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I did too well, except for map drawing. You liked maps. I liked maps, I always did, but I wasn't <coughs> so good in memorization. Uh -huh. And that's something we'll touch on later on, because uh -huh. when geography became a subject where I had to memorize at one university later on, I was turned off, oh. you see. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think geography should always be a subject that kindles your imagination, but it really shouldn't be something where you have to memorize. Yes. And in the, in the minds of the public, too often it's a subject where you sort of are supposed to be a walking atlas, and right. somebody says, how high is this mountain, or how many people live in that city, you're supposed mm -hmm. to know automatically. Yeah. And if you don't know, they say, well, I thought you were a geographer, geographer right? Yes. I'm sure it's happened to you <laughs> oh, yes. hundreds of times. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. So you did gymnasium in Germany, in France? Not all of it. Not all of uh, it. I then lived in France for yes. uh, a year and a half outside of Paris. Yes. Uh, then uh, my parents sent me to England. They felt I should go to a public school in England. My brother was sent to Switzerland, not far from here, to Lausanne. Uh, I finished high school in England at Lindisfarne College in, in Essex. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, in 1937, uh, my parents sent me a telegram to meet me on 
board the SS Washington in Southampton Harbor on their trip to the United States. And I lived in New York for about a month. And then we went <coughs> on to, through the Panama Canal mm. to um, Los Angeles. And there I went to Los Angeles City College for two years, UCLA for two years, and then I entered the Army, the U.S. Army. What a saga. <laughs> you didn't say what your father's occupation was. My father was a judge in, in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, uh, because part of the fa my family was Jewish, uh, he was asked to resign from the, uh, from the bench. Uh, a couple of years after Hitler came to power, uh, then he went into the uh, business of my father my his father-in-law, my grandfather, mm -hmm. and he thought the whole thing sort of would uh, finish after two or three years, but it didn't. And then, uh, with very good advice from some of my relatives, uh, he decided to move to the United States. I still have some relatives in the Frankfurt area. Mm -hmm. um, some of them stayed because some of them were Protestants and some of them were Catholics and, mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we're very good friends and mm -hmm. we had get-togethers. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them I remembered me from uh, as a little boy and yes. some of them I had actually never seen, but yes. we had some good family reunions just a few days ago. But the fact, but it was a good thing for um, that my family moved because on the other side of the family, some of them ended up in concentration camps, and that wasn't so good. Oh, dear me. But, um, mm, but now in, we're in Los Angeles. Now we? we're in Los Angeles. All of a sudden, I had to decide when I entered Los Angeles City College, I, we didn't, my father had to leave most of his property behind, so we were not wealthy, mm -hmm. not destitute either, but I had to go to a college that was free. I think mm -hmm. the uh, total cost for a year's tuition was $10, <laughs> which is very surprising in this day and age. Yeah. But one of the first questions I was asked was, um, what, what are you going to major in? And I was given a list of uh, subjects. Well, I, I, it really hadn't, I had not given too much thought about it. I knew I want, didn't want to go into business yes. because um, Financial independence really didn't mean that much to me. Mm. Um, and I saw the word geography. I had a very good geography teacher in England, by the way, uh -huh. who let me draw lots of maps <laughs> and, uh, and uh, who was a very stimulating lecturer. Mm. His name was Joseph Ecott. Uh, for, mm. He had just graduated from uh, Cambridge <coughs> University and we became good friends. He was also my my football and tennis coach, and I was much interested in sports at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, so without, I think I decided, I had to decide between geology and geography, but because I was also very much interested in rocks. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then I saw that you had to take all kinds of chemistry and physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, I didn't want to start in with chemistry right away, and there were all kinds of interesting courses listed with geography. So I said, okay, I'll major in, in, uh -huh. in geography, which I did. And I did rather well. So in my junior year, I went on to UCLA. Mm -hmm. And I had some very good teachers. Who was there? The and um, one of <coughs> the teachers that took me under her wing yes. right away, uh, and I know, you, you know who I, whose name I'm going to mention was was Ruth Ball, uh -huh. B A U G H, yes. who was the, um, the the disciple I think of Ellen Churchill Semple. Oh yes. Uh -huh. Of course, at that time, the name Semple didn't mean anything to, to me. You, yeah. Right. And um, but she was a lovely lady, and um, she had a great deal of concern for me as an individual human being. Uh -huh. And we talked a lot about Europe and about geography. And one of the first things she did was to give me a, 
Simple's book on the geography of the Mediterranean. Oh, that was one of my first books in geography. Was it? Oh, I really like that one. And that yeah. book really overwhelmed me because it was it it is so beautifully written, yes. and it's also a very scholarly book. Yes. And I thought, gee, uh, uh, what a wonderful book! He, all these footnotes yes. with Latin and Greek and Arabic sources, yes. not to speak of French and German and Italian and so on. And her book on the pastures of the Mediterraneans and, yes. and the irrigation lands of the Mediterraneans and all the world is heir to the Mediterranean, all the world is yes. her debtor. Yes. And um, her descriptions of the Mediterranean pleasure gardens and so on. So I took her course on the geography of the Mediterranean. Um, so she became uh, my mentor to some extent. I also had courses from Robert Glendinning, yes. uh, who was. Uh, much more rigid, much more Apollonian in his yes. thinking. Um, I had courses from Joseph Spencer, oh. from um, uh, who was a disciple of Carl Sauer. Yeah. Uh, there was Clifford Zierer, yes. who who taught a course on the geography of resources. There was um, Henry Bruman, also a product of the Berkeley School. Mm -hmm on the geography of Latin America, but I really liked regional geography. Yeah. And uh, it's not until much later that I got into the systematic aspects. Mm. I graduated in 1942, uh, and uh, at that time I was ready to go in the, into the army, but I still had not gotten my U.S. citizenship, and I was oh. told I had to wait. and. Uh, I remember shortly after graduation, Robert Glendinning came to, came to me and said, would you like to teach a course, the introductory course in geography, uh -huh. uh, starting next week? And I said, <laughs> ma, uh, I had never even thought about something like that. I was ready to go into the army. It was the summer session. Mm -hmm. and." Uh, I said, well, I don't know whether I can do it or not. And he said, well, I think you can, but um, if, if you have any questions, I'll be in my office and you can ask me. So a week later, I had 120 people sitting in my class oh, on introductory geography. And, um, the, uh, and I wasn't even 21 yet, oh my. you see. Oh, what so a I was pushed into teaching geography, yeah. but I very soon found out that I liked it. Yes. And I did this for all that summer, and that fall I taught both the first and second semester of the first year of mm -hmm. introductory geography, and then I entered the, the army. And because I could read maps, they put me into the Corps of Engineers, and I trained in Alabama and uh, Missouri and was sent overseas. And when they found out I was also fluent in a number of languages, they put me into the intelligence. Mm -hmm. I was asked, they, in, in fact, it was the OSS. Mm -hmm. They were going to put me into very sensitive intelligence work but I flunked one test. Deliberately? No, <laughs> not deliberately, much to my chagrin. <laughs> it was the, um, the involuntary <coughs> reaction test. Uh -huh. It's a test uh, where they see how you react to certain things. And I found out that they found out, I found out, that I blush very easily. Uh -huh. And if you blush very easily, even if you're not guilty yeah. about anything that's embarrassing or yeah. so on, you, can, you cannot be used in that particular type of activity. So because I blush easily, <laughs> uh, I was uh, put into the um, uh, prisoner interrogation uh, section. Mm -hmm. But I was also used um, first uh, to link up with the Free French, and I was dropped with a parachute in France before D-Day, wow. and uh, made some of the we made some of the connection with the Free French, um, 
and I was with the combat engineers for the first part of the war. I was wounded during the Battle of the Bulge, sent back to Paris. Then I was attached to the Mobile Field, Inter in Mobile Field Intelligence Unit, number four, under Omar Bradley. And then we interviewed uh, prisoners of war uh, both in Luxembourg and then in, in Wiesbaden. And we had some high-ranking generals, in, in, oh including von Rundstedt. Oh. I even had Julius Streicher wow. uh, in prison in Wiesbaden. Oh, and yes. uh, I was alone with him for a, few, a little while, and, uh, but I restrained myself. What an experience. Um, I w had another interesting experience. I'm just telling yes. you about the experiences that have some geographical interests. Um, I uh, was asked by my commanding officer to interview um, Karl Haushofer. Uh, oh. And uh, so I spent about 10 days with him and his wife oh. in, um, I, th I think it was a name like Hochschimmelhof or something like that. Mm in Bavaria and, um, and wrote up a, a complete account on my findings, including that there was really no Institute for Geopolitik. Uh, it was a top secret document which was later taken by uh, Father Walsh and published in, mostly in, in published under his name in, in Life magazine, but I couldn't do anything about that. But that will always be something that I Will remember very that much. Must have been a dramatic experience. But I found I learned a lot about uh, learned a lot about Haushofer, and even today in, in my classes on the history of geographic thought, when I speak about Ratzel, I always tell them about what um, Karl um, told um, 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 what's Ratzel's first name. Friedrich. What Friedrich told Karl, mm -hmm. and then what Karl uh, told Rudolf, and oh. then Rudolf told Adolf, oh. and, and how uh, these thoughts then uh, influenced, to some extent, how some mm. thoughts of a geographer really influenced the history of the world. Yes, yes, yes. It's not to be taken lightly, <coughs> but... Sure. It, it, it makes a nice little story how yes. the concepts of a geographer, how, how um, Ratzel's thoughts sort of flowed. It's, it's part of the history of geographic thought yes. into the minds of, uh, let's swing. say, a major policy maker, yes. right? Yes. Uh, from his cellmate, uh, and uh, perhaps for, for those who will see this tape, I should say that I was speaking of Hess. Right. Yes. Rudolf Hess then told Adolf Hitler, and um, that they, these thoughts then went into Mein Kampf and uh, became party policy. So uh, another aspect perhaps that I should mention um, that went into my later um, thinking was that I saw so many cities destroyed. That must have been tragic. Right? And when you see all these cities destroyed and even help to destroy them, if you're a feeling human being, you must really think about too later on what will be built up in, 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 in their place, right? I and that's see. that those were the seeds of my interest in, in city planning. I can right? see it, yes, yes. I can well and, that's and, a really and clear connection. So it's Frankfurt mm. and and and, and yes. the, and uh, the outskirts of Munich and, and the World War II, and th this was the basis. Am I speaking in too much detail? No, that, or, just, uh, that was uh, a perfectly, uh, perfectly right. good thing, because uh. when then after the war, when you came over, were there any other wartime experiences that were quite as dramatic as that? Yeah, we, we, yes. Uh, well, particularly the post-war experiences. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, um, I could mention a few more, but they would be along the same line. But there was a major immediate post-war experience. Yes. Um, I was, it was after VE Day, and we were all waiting to be shipped to Japan. VE Day, again for the listeners, is, was 
um, Victory in Europe Day. I guess that's what the abbreviation is, because later on there was VJ Day, Victory in Japan. And um, we were sort of marching time. I was stationed in, in Oberursel at a prisoner of war camp where we had to interview prisoners, either strategic discourses or, or tactical squeezes, whatever was needed. And um, a, a, a memoranda came around about who wanted to go to a university. And everybody wanted to go to the Sorbonne or, and so on. And I said to myself, no, I'll do something different. I, wouldn't, I won't have a chance because everybody wants to go to the Sorbonne. I looked over the list and I saw the U Université de Grenoble. Mm -hmm. Good, tell that one. <laughs> and, um, and I was always very much interested, as I told you, in rocks and mountains. I love the mountains and loved mountain climbing. I didn't tell you about the vacations we took in Switzerland and so on. Right. So um, I said, no, I want to go to Grenoble because I want to study mountain geography. Uh -huh. right? So um, mine was one of the first to come through. Nash! <laughs> what Grenoble, a thrill. Right? So off I went. And um, there I was. Um, actually, I had to teach two courses one on the geography of the United States in French uh -huh. to the French students that, that were there, and then one on the geography of France in English to the Americans that were stationed there. I see. And I only had to do that on Wednesdays and Thursdays, these lectures. Then I, I had see. big weekends. And those week, I got to know Raoul Blanchard, sure. yes. uh, who became my mentor. And um, so we took a lot of field trips into the Pre-Alps, mm -hmm. uh, particularly. Uh, also into the, into the mass various massifs and into, into the inter-alpine zone. And um, I also took a, a couple of trips into to Switzerland. Oh, well, I, should, I should tell you one short story. Yeah. Um, I had a uh, girlfriend from my early youth that lived in Geneva. I was just reminiscing about that yesterday. <laughs> and I thought I'd make contact with her and I called her, but I didn't have much money. So I asked Raoul Blanchard how I could finance that. And he had an excellent idea. And I learned one of my first, uh, I had my, one of my first lessons in international economic geography. He <laughs> said, Nash, allez à Lyon et achetez un uh, saxophone. Mm -hmm. Buy a saxophone, he said, because the Swiss need musical instruments. And then, when you get there, buy something that the French need. So I took the train to Lyon and bought a saxophone. When I came to Geneva, I sold my saxophone. I had quite a bit of money to spend, and I met her again and her parents. We had a lovely weekend. Then, on Monday morning, I bought a nice little Hermes typewriter. Oh. These were these little typewriters. Yes. I put it in my briefcase and took it back in Lyon. I got enough money for it just to buy another saxophone. <laughs> and so I financed my occasional weekend in Switzerland. But Blanchard, uh, advised, uh, Blanchard you advised me to do that. <laughs> Fine. And, um, uh, but I was so impressed with Blanchard because it was really microgeography at its very best. He knew everyone. And I should tell you right now, so I don't forget later, that uh, I did a great deal of field work with him in the Vercors, in the Massif du Vercors, yes. one of the pre-Alpine massifs right outside of Grenoble. And I gathered so much material there that I uh, carried it back with me and analyzed it and drew the maps that I sketched. And that became my master's thesis uh -huh. in geography at UCLA. Right? Which record. I did with, with, with um, Ruth Ball. Yeah. And um, I also published my very first article in 1945 in the Revue de, Revue de Géographie Alpine okay. about the destructions uh -huh. in the Vercors by the German army. Because the, the Vercors is a huge, it's a mountain bastion like this, yes. Argonian limestone. It, it's, it's a syncline, very flat top. And the, the Marquis, the Free French, hid out there. Uh -huh. But they were inaccessible. But one night, the Germans landed there with gliders, about 200 strong. And they killed almost everybody in the area, all the livestock. Um, and and the, the whole area was 
destitute. And so Blanche and I went around and made a survey of all the things that happened. And that also became one of the chapters in my, thesis. In my thesis. But he and I became very good friends. Now, to just tell you one more thing. It's one August day. We were high in the Alps. We stopped at the farmhouse. And we had lunch out on the lawn. And we, as usual, we had a few drinks. Not cheese, because he didn't like cheese. No. Very interesting for a Frenchman not to like That's cheese. Extraordinary. Je ne veux pas de fromage, you know. But uh, then we heard somebody talk about la bombe atomique. And I asked him, qu'est-ce que c'est la bombe atomique? And he said, c'est pas, c'est pas. Well, we went off somewhere else. In the evening, we went to another Alpine hut where they had a little bar. And again, people were talking about La Bombe Atomique. Uh, and I asked him again. And so he said, OK, I'll find out. So he went over and talked to these people. Then he came back to me and he said, Nash, la guerre est finie. La <laughs> guerre est finie. The war is over. Fantastic moment. And then we got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I wouldn't have to go to Japan. Fantastic. Hmm? I'll always moment. remember that. Hmm? That must have been a most And that was, and the, the war was over three days before, and we didn't even, and I didn't even know about it. Of course, <laughs> we were up in the mountains. Up in the mountains. Hmm? That must be. Really so from there, uh, I also worked a little bit with, with uh, Paul Veyre, uh -huh, uh, who was a young assistant at that time, and I look forward to meeting him in ANSI in a couple of weeks, um, who helped me with my French and with that oh, article to yes. be published. And then uh, after all that, I went back, f uh, did my master's. Then I decided, where will I go? Well. Hartshorn had just come out with his Nature of Geography. Mm -hmm. I decided, all right, there were other uh, universities that I wanted to go. Uh, I had a chat with Carl Sauer. He didn't seem to be too interested in, in giving any assistantships. He said, after you've been here for a year or two, maybe we'll give you one. That wasn't too encouraging, even though I u knew Jan Brook quite well. Um, I had an offer from Ohio State, a couple of other universities, but Hartshorn, okay. I went there, and he was very friendly, and I um, picked him as my advisor. But then I couldn't, because Trevorthe was chairman of the department. But Trevorthe made me take all kinds of courses, like climatology. And he made me take his China seminar and so on. And I was told exactly what to teach and how to teach it from the famous Bible. Uh -huh. at that time, yes. Finch and Tuborf, Finch Elements and of Geography. <laughs> and as the year went on, I became more and more restless, because not only were we as graduate students asked to memorize, but we had to see to it the students memorized every little, little detail about what amount of sunlight was reflected and, and, and mm -hmm. the soil compositions and, and, and things I had to memorize myself and, and again, and, and, and I didn't feel the students really enjoyed all these many things, and, and imagination was stifled. I remember we were studying weather, and I read them a little passage from Stuart's book, The Storm, which is mm -hmm. one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And he came to me one afternoon, he said, I hear you're reading fiction to your students in the class. Don't you have something better to do? And I said <sighs> to myself, that this isn't the place for me. Right. So I met John Gorse mm -hmm. at that university, a famous, uh, not famous, well, a well-known political scientist mm -hmm. who had written several books on regional planning. And he's, he didn't get along too well at Wisconsin either. Uh, but he was a highly, highly respected political scientist. And he said he had just gotten a professorship at Harvard. Would I come along as his assistant? So uh -huh. I said, OK, I'll come along. That's how you came to Harvard. And, uh, what year he, now? Uh, that was 1947. Mm -hmm. But when I got there, things, uh, he wasn't really able to give me an assistantship. So I went over to geography, and they were in difficulties. Mm -hmm. So I said, why not uh, enroll in the Graduate School of Design? Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was a very 
good thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. And I spent the next two years in the Graduate School of Design uh, in, in the Department of City Planning and Landscape Architecture, mm -hmm. where I had some excellent teachers, um, Holmes Perkins, Martin Wagner, Ed Allman was teaching there at the time. He, he, his, his time was primarily in city planning, but he also taught a couple of courses in geography, one on transportation and one on cities, and I took them both. He and I became pretty good friends. Um, uh, Logan was there, and, um, and Ackerman was there. And um, there was a very good link between the Graduate School of Design and Geography, but I won't go into the details yeah. of the demise of no. geography at this time. <coughs> but, and I taught a Radcliffe section at, uh, on, uh, of students in geography. Mm -hmm. um, that was sort of a, a crumb that was thrown to me. Uh -huh. uh, uh, that was before women's liberation. Uh -huh. Radcliffe is the women, was the women's yes. college of Harvard, so as, you, as you know. So they all look forward to the Nash arrival, yes. And, um, and then I... Um, uh, then I got the MCP degree, the Master of City Planning, and um, actually later on I got also the MPA, Master of Public Administration degree, when I mm -hmm. worked in the city of Medford and, and uh, when I was the city planning uh, director of uh, the city of Medford outside of Boston. And then I had a number of positions upon graduation from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. First. Uh, I was the senior planning assistant in uh, the city of Boston. Then I was a senior planner in the city of Worcester. We had some very nice uh, associations with the uh, Graduate School of Geography okay. there. Glad and to hear. and uh, some of the geography students uh, really helped me quite a lot in mm -hmm. developing a master plan for the city of Worcester. Then uh, from there, I went back to the city of Boston as the uh, senior planner for the Boston Housing Authority. Then I was offered a, a job with the um, uh, city of Medford as the planning director. That's where I worked very closely with the mm -hmm. city manager and really be went deeply into politics mm -hmm. and, um, and then went back and taught some courses in the Graduate School of Public Administration. Also taught at BU and North e Northeastern University at Night School and slowly finished my PhD at that time. I interestingly enough, well, to me it was interesting, it, my PhD dissertation is not about geography. It's about planning. It's yeah. about planning. It's actually the role of the um, planning director in a council manager form of government. And my goodness. It's the, uh, and Could have passed in a political a, science department. It was, it was a case study of all the city managers, cities in Massachusetts, and um, and, it, and one of the chapters, of course, was autobiographical, where I asked myself the question, what am I doing here? And, uh -huh. and, 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 but each chapter also had a geographical section of each city. Mm -hmm. And from there, I went to, uh, I was offered a position as associate professor at the University of North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, where I taught planning and also worked at the Institute for uh, Research and Social Science. And then in 1957, when I attended the, uh, am I going too slowly or how much more time do we have? We have uh, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, hour, okay. <laughs> because I want you to ask me some questions too. Okay. See, once you get me started, yes, I guess it's with everybody. It's once they start talking about their life, but I'll go quickly <laughs> now because you want me to concentrate on my, early, mm. on my early period. I'll just mention that from there I went to um, uh, Cincinnati, because I was asked to take over the uh, Department of Geography and Geology oh. at the University of Cincinnati and helped with the separation of the two, but I made, made it into a Department of Geography and Regional Planning yes. at the University of Cincinnati. I stayed there for four years, from 1959 to 1963, and then I was asked to be the dean of the graduate school at the University of Rhode Island, where I stayed for seven years. But I also founded a, a, a school of community planning and area development there, and I was concomitantly the director of that school. Mm -hmm. And then finally, 
after a year sabbatical where I taught at Boston College in the Institute for Human Sciences, I was asked to come to Canada to the University of Waterloo to start a faculty of environmental studies that has four units, two professional schools and two academic departments. The professional schools are a school of architecture and a school of urban and regional planning, and the two departments are the Department of Geography and the Department of Man Environment Studies. And um, that's, I thought I'd only be there for five years. Mm. I've been there now for 14 years, and, um, feel and yeah. probably will, will retire there. So I've been there longer than I have ever been any place else. Yes, it gave you plenty scope for yeah. expressing most of yeah. those interests. Yeah. But that is an extraordinary career, so diverse, your interests. Now there's, yeah. But has there been, can you see some continuity of, of mission? For example, this thing that struck you during the war, that the, the destroyed cities demanded some solution. Was there all the time after the war that concern to make knowledge applicable to the resolution or reconstruction of reality? I or think so. These, once you see a city destroyed, you, you also automatically think about architecture and urban design. Yes. So at Harvard, of course, I had to take a lot of courses in architecture too. Actually, my PhD, technically, is in architectural sciences, Isn't you see. Yes. And I did quite a bit <coughs> of work with Walter Gropius, who was a well-known German architect yes. who was teaching there. And uh, so some of our exercises were actually based on the reconstruction of some of these cities that had been destroyed. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So there is, the, there is something, there, is a connect, there was a connection there. Uh -huh. And by the way, uh, here's a little anecdote. Yeah. You know how some graduate students suffer through language exams? Yes. I'll tell you how nice m mine was. Sure. I had to take my language exams in German and French, mm -hmm. and I was told, see one of your professors. So I went to Walter Gropius, yes. who also speaks French and German uh, fluently, and I said, Professor Gropius, would you be willing to give me my German and French exams? Yeah, he said, let's go and have lunch. And we had a marvelous <laughs> lunch. In the first part, we, we spoke in French. In the second part, we spoke in German. Then he signed the papers, and that was all there was to it. What a way to get through. Wasn't that nice? That was a nice, <laughs> nice solution. Yeah. But he asked me one difficult question. He said, I just had a letter from Richard Neutre, who was, who was a famous German mm -hmm. architect living in, in, in the US. And he asked me to give me um, a, a translation of his book. Um, what, uh, so he said, why, how could he translate into German um, survival through design? Uh -huh. And I just wasn't able. What, what do you say, überleben durch Entwurf, or something like that? He said, well, I'm not going to flunk you, he said, <laughs> but, but there are some technical words in every language that are almost not impossible to trans translate, and, and design is, almost, is a word that is almost untranslatable because it has so many d different meetings, and survival, the same thing. Especially uh, for And then we get survival through design. It's, well, yes. you asked me some questions, some right. specific I questions wonder, now. How important it is when I hear this story that you knew several languages, that you had had a diversity of experiences geographically and, you know, humanly. How much has all of that contributed to your vision of geography today? Well, I, my feeling is that one, one has to be completely open. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm constantly changing. And once in a while, students come to me and they say, Dr. Nash, I really don't know what I want to do. And you know what I say to them? You've got I right. don't think I know what I want to do. <laughs> I have the feeling once in a while that I really do, haven't made up my mind yet what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly changing. And I think every, a, a, a lot of scholars, or let, let's say Dionysians like you and me, although we have some strong Apollonians tra yes. traits, uh, really know that we are constantly changing. Yes. And geography is constantly changing. And when I talk to you about my 
epistemological chart in, mm. in the 10 epistemologies and the 10 mm. criteria for evaluation that we've talked about in the past, mm. it's not as some people think that I want to put myself into a box and say, mm. I'm an existentialist or I'm a logical positivist and so on, and these are the criteria that I'm interested in, but it's just to give myself a snapshot of where I am at this particular place in time. Where have I been? Where am I now? And then to have a whole panorama of all the things that I might be doing in the future. And then there are some epistemologies that you and I haven't even thought of yet. Mm. And, and uh, so it, it's a wide open world. And um, so I'm basically, if you want to put a label on me, maybe I should be called a pluralist yes. because I'd like to I'd like to be everything. So mm. when I was asked at the University of Waterloo when I when my term as as dean was up, what department you want to be in? Mm -hmm. They wanted to put me in a box, you know. Yes. I said, "Uh uh, <laughs> you gave me an appointment in the Faculty of Environmental Studies and I'm going to be a professor. So now I'm a professor of architecture geography and city and regional planning. I don't want to be put in any box. That is a fortunate uh, position to well, be in. Not that uh, uh, I want to be more than a geographer, mm -hmm. but I'd like to be a geographer and something else and something else. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I've always been that. And you also have a philosophical streak. You, you want clarity of thought on the one hand, in a very abstract way, and you want to make practical solutions to problems on the other. Yeah. If you had to choose between one or the other, I know that you, you fuse them, you, you see yes. some interaction between them, but if you had to choose one way or the other. I, I think the two are inseparable, and I was particularly struck at our meeting just now that many, many of my friends mm -hmm. uh, were in applied geography and have sort of oozed into the history of geographic thought. It's really amazing. Right? Yes. Isn't it amazing? Van Parson, yes. um, uh, Walter Freeman, well, we, 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 can, we, yes. can, we, we can name quite a few of them that ha have been dyed in the wool, uh, Appl not applicators, that doesn't sound right, um, uh, practitioners yes. of, of geography. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, uh, thinking about it. Now, there may, some people may say, well, they're getting old, mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, it's, but it's not like the Canadian Senate, you know, in the Canadian Senate, it's not like the American Senate, you get appointed to the Canadian Senate after you're no longer useful, after you no longer get elected, they put you in the Senate for pasture, right? Uh -huh. That isn't what I mean. Uh, <laughs> I think a good geographer is like a two-headed two bird, who can look forward and backward, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what you and Walter Freeman and, and, and Van Parsons and, and, and the others that I've mentioned have in common is that we have a strong feeling for time, yes. right? Mm -hmm. The flow of time. And so we do look forward. We, 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 we have a vision of the future. We anticipate what is coming. But at the same time, we are also deeply interested in what has gone on before, that we have a thorough understanding, this Verstehen, yes. about what has been. Mm. And so perhaps there's just a difference in emphasis. Now we want a better understanding of perhaps the last uh, few decades that we've gone through mm. and sort of say, oh, where, where have I been? You know, what, what's gone on these last few decades? And s still be much interested as to what can be accomplished, but we know that our lifespan now in the future is somewhat limited. Right. And so we are a little bit more concerned about the retrospective view because we know we don't have quite as many decades ahead of us as we had 30, 40 years ago. Yes, yes. Well, it's a welcome addition to the history of geographic thought to have people with, with a lot of applied experience such as you people have. It's really marvelous. You were very instrumental in that Commission on Applied Geography, and that in yeah. itself could make a long story. Uh, you've spoken, Peter, about your work in applied geography, in design, in philosophy, and the history of the field. But there's one thing that really fascinated me about your work. You wrote an article, I think it was a paper you delivered at an international congress, on the geography of music. 
And now music is an enormously rich uh, mode of human expression. Does it for you, in a way, link those two interests? Does it, does it express both of them for you? It's not necessarily, not necessarily a link, but I think there's a great deal that geographers can say about music and uh, there's a great deal that com composers or musicians can uh, show in, in their art about geography, about the areas in which they live. It all happened, uh, it seriously started back in 1968, I think it was, uh, before the international meeting, the IGU meeting in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. and I tried to apply for a grant to go and uh, I didn't see much of a chance but there was a nice grant being offered in the humanities. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, well, what do the humanities consist of? And then I thought about music. And I said, well, I think I'll do something about music and geography because I always thought about the interrelationship between the two. And it was actually, it intensified in Boston because Durbin Twittlesey mm -hmm. on some Friday afternoons when he didn't have somebody else to go with would say to me, Peter, would you like to go and hear the Boston Symphony? And he would then invite me and I'd go with him and we'd make a few remarks here and there about the geographical aspects and we'd uh, joke about how uh, Sibelius would remind you of a, uh, a de-climate. Yes. <laughs> <How you> uh <-huh. laughs> Not just Finland, uh -huh. but a de-climate. Uh, of a de-climate, right? <laughs> or uh, how you'd have Mediterranean types of rhythms and, mm. and, um, and uh, there are certain types of melodies that can be played in, in, in certain ways that if you change the rhythm, it, it immediately um, identifies the geographical location of, mm -hmm. of what you're doing. So I said to myself, what, uh, perhaps one of the most fundamental questions, what can be shown about music on maps? Mm -hmm. And so I did about 24 different maps yes. from the distant, Mu world music zones and, and the spread of polyphony and, um, and musical, uh, the world more um, specifically divided into musical types, the, uh, the migration of, 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 uh, of um, major musical systems, um, the, uh, the distribution of world music centers, the travels of composers, uh, in, in my article, there are about 20, 20 different things. Uh, there could have been more. And so the, the talk consists of the early uh, development of music, uh, oral music, um, the, sp the, the spread of music, and so on, um, the uh, tonal systems uh, as they're related to latitude and altitude. Uh, I use the example of Italy, where you're down in deep down in Sicily, only males can sing, and generally they're so deep, deep down there. So as you go move up the Pennine Peninsula, especially once you cross the Alps, the women can join in, right? Oh. So uh, <laughs> the, the, there's an awful lot of, uh, I had quite a bit of environmental determinism in this, but you can see why some of the er earlier geographers were somewhat deterministic. But th there are all kinds of relationships, the distribution of clocks, um, and, uh, 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 not clocks, uh, that, uh, that, that's another story. The distribution of bells. Yes. Mm? The, uh, the, the, the distribution of raw materials to music. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I, uh, and one more thing is that oh, people are shocked about this paper, yes. you know. And actually, the newspapers in New Delhi came out the next day as geographer speaks about music. And then uh, one, and they were all sort of humor, had humor in them. Students will learn about Vienna while while the gramophone plays the uh, the Blue Danube waltz. They, they really didn't understand uh, what I was saying, and um, they, but the important thing is that if we can um, speak, 
if geographers, and, and we've learned that in the last decades, if we can, we cannot only concentrate on speaking about the tangible aspects of the environment, mm -hmm. but we can speak about the intangible aspects. It's not only just architecture, mm. uh, the tremendous number of things in music that can be mapped. Yes. But uh, even the notation system not as yeah. a way in which to express our understanding of a place uh, or an event uh, or something. Yes, I was very much struck by that article. Yeah. Yes. And there have been some, some new studies now, and, and uh, the whole aspect of soundscapes and so yes. on. Uh, but at that time, people were th thought I was a little bit nuts. Crazy. But, <laughs> I, but I had fun. I had, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful topic, and I, I think there much more will be done uh, yes. on that, not just with class, so-called classical music and music history, but what's going on at the present time. The diffusion, yes. uh, uh, I'll have to speak to Hegerstein about it, really, yes. about just the, the, the diffusion of, of, um, of, yes. of certain um, types of music yes. or even popular records and mm -hmm. how quickly do they diffuse and mm -hmm. where are the centers of origin and so yes. on. Yes. Uh, there are tremendous number of, of geographical implications in this. Oh and yes. I think of migrant groups, you know, the, the Bahia, the Brazilian groups, for example, yeah. the Caribbean groups, how much music gives them a sense of identity when away from home. And it's true yeah. of the Irish in America, it's true of Swedes in America, yes. and so on. Yes. Well, Peter, I'm terribly sorry our time has come up. We could talk for the rest of the evening. But I think that through your life and your career and your work, you have done more than any other to make it a field that provokes the imagination, which was your own first wish about the field. And I think there is a, there is a symphony of activity here, which will be very inspiring for those who see this tape. Well, Thank you very much, Peter. As usual, it's been a great pleasure talking with you and, me, and sharing a few thoughts with you, Anne. Wonderful. Thank right. you very much. <laughs>